thank you very much and thank you for this opportunity to speak on this panel. Um, I will speak uh, about the implications of our work on the ongoing uh, and recent, uh, recent and ongoing de debates on the post-2015 uh, international development agenda and the um, sustainable development goals, and particularly with respect to how those debates have addressed the issue of global governance and, secondly, the application of human rights principles and norms. However, I'd just like to start by commenting that um, uh, this work uh, of the CDT this year is a follow-up, uh, as, um, as you already mentioned, of the uh, work in, um, in earlier years on the MDGs um, and uh, the international agenda. Um, but we um, point out more specifically that um, the some of the issues that Diane Elson mentioned uh, regarding the policies needed to address inequality uh, were, uh, in fact, uh, very, uh, very carefully studied in detail and published in, in this book, Alternative Development Strategies for the Post-1915 Agenda Era. And this was work that was carried out in 2010, 2011, 2012. Uh, and they are they were presented to the ECOSOC in the CDP report of 2012, and and there in particular we we emphasize uh, that drawing on the lessons of the successful experience of of, of countries across the world, um, we find a certain number of um, policy choices that were um, that were were effective. Um, and, and this, of course, refers not only to the experience of the um, uh, uh, Latin American countries in reducing inequality in the last decade or two, but also in earlier decades in other, other regions. Um, so we emphasize, for example, that all of these countries pursued very proactive industrial and labor market policies uh, as that, that that resulted both in robust growth as well as poverty reduction and, uh, um, and, and a growth pattern that did not come with increasing inequality. Um, and uh, secondly, of course, there has been uh, a very important emphasis on um, proactive social policies and social protection. <coughs> and, uh, and finally, of course, uh, macroeconomic was an important uh, aspect of some of these experiences, but the ability to pursue proactive uh, uh, counter-cyclical, excuse me, counter-cyclical <laughs> macroeconomic policies uh, in the face of um, uh, changes in the international environment was another important aspect. Um, so uh, the policy space that Diane Nelson mentioned and, and, and many of the issues that um, Jose Antonio Campo raised um, also reflect the findings of the earlier uh, work of the CDP. Um, now, moving on to the question of uh, global governance, um, and um, as uh, Diana Elson has already um, mentioned, there is wide agreement that the MDG 8 was uh, both a leading conception and disappointing in implementation. Um, now, it's therefore, the current debates have emphasized um, this, uh, this issue as an important um, priority. Um, however, um, the issue of global governance, actually, has somehow <coughs> fallen between the stools. Um, for example, um, uh, the current debates about some of these international economic arrangements fall under, uh, I think, focus area 12, I believe it is, um, which uh, is about um, uh, inequality. And then there's another uh, issue, which is about means of implement, focus area, which is about means of implementation, uh, which includes this whole area of 
partnership. Um, and, and those areas do certainly include many important points. But what is not there are some of these institutional and procedural issues, um, such as the importance of um, inclusion, and I would say participation, uh, transparency, accountability, as the, uh, the, the, the principles that should guide the process of decision making in global governance. And moreover, um, while the, uh, the recent debates <coughs> have uh, enlarged uh, the scope of issues being discussed under the area of partnership, uh, it does not focus on some of the issues that we have raised, such as uh, uh, coordination in terms of taxation. Um, and, um, and some of the, um, the issues around migration, even though, in fact, there is quite a lot of emphasis in these debates on the way that remittances are, are managed. Um, so um, the, the other aspect of this is, of course, these issues of um, international um, uh, decision making um, that should be governed by inclusion, accountability, transparency, um, are issues of governance. And yet, in the uh, current debates, issues of governance uh, have been put together with the rule of law and with um, peace building. And uh, somehow, therefore, the emphasis has been on strengthening um, global, um, uh, sorry, uh, has been strengthening at national level uh, uh, governance and a rule of law that is somewhat restrictively interpreted um, uh, as the application of law as opposed to the pursuit of justice uh, and access to justice for all. Um, and so this kind of shifting of um, framing uh, of the issue of governance into this direction of uh, national level processes in the context particularly of peace building, I think has once again kind of left out uh, the, the, the importance of global governance processes, procedures, institutions, and the importance of the principles uh, of um, that should, should, should guide international decisions. And this brings me, of course, to the question of human rights principles. Um, once again, um, this has already been raised by uh, Diane Elson, who we call the, uh, the right to an enabling international uh, order, uh, a right to um, an environment. And that is um, in, that is, in uh, international law, <laughs> this is uh, all about the application of law. When we talk about human rights, there is, an, uh, there is a tendency to emphasize uh, individual freedoms, the freedom uh, from want and freedom from fear. But the other side of uh, human rights is the correlate obligations, uh, particularly of states. And so states do have important obligations to, to respect, protect, and fulfill the rights of people with respect to freedom of fear, freedom from, from want. But, uh, and in particular, as uh, has already been pointed out, um, there are these obligations to create an enabling environment for, for development. And what does that actually mean? Well, some of the work that has been done in the human rights context, and particularly in the context of the work of uh, um, uh, on, on the uh, Declaration on the Right to Development has actually identified some of those uh, obligations. And those obligations um, are to maintain a stable economic and financial environment, uh, reducing risks of international economic and financial crises, reducing volatility of commodity prices, developing a non-discriminatory international trading system, ensuring access to technology, ensuring environmental Ability, promoting access to financial and human resources, implementing equitable approaches to the sharing of benefits and burdens of development, such as environmental burdens and shops. So 
these are obligations that should be guiding the post-2015 agenda. And that, the, the, the basic principle that there should be uh, you know, the, the coherence uh, and uh, respect for international human rights legal principles uh, is, is, is emphasized everywhere. But I, I think that when we come to the details, what it actually means, somehow uh, it, it, gets, um, it gets dropped. So um, um, I think that um, when we go back to reviewing these um, uh, different, uh, how many are there, there are 19 focus uh, themes, um, we will note that, in fact, uh, when it comes to the partnership uh, uh, issue and the governance issue and the equality issue, those three thematic areas, somehow the agenda for global governance that should be uh, equitable in terms of participation and accountable to human rights obligations um, and need to be reinforced. Thank you very much. And I think one of the things that we are referring to here uh, in different ways is that now relating to this issue of accountability, that when you have greater yeah, private sector involvement in uh, development activities, there has to be accountability there as well, accountability to the government, accountability to people. Um, and I think that's, and then in the, in the context of asymmetries of power, uh, accountability is, is difficult to enforce. That those are some of the issues that we are raising uh, in, um, in different ways in, in, this, in this report. Um, as far as the, um, uh, the issue of the rule of law, I, I wasn't sure if I understood your comment or, or question. You were saying that, uh, uh, that, that, the, that the rule of law and justice had somehow become has come to be seen through the lens of conflict and, sec and security as opposed to development. Uh, is that right? And then, so I would definitely agree with you um, about the need to bring in bring conflicts and security also in terms of development. And, and there, I think uh, some of the things that we had said in earlier in, in our earlier reports emphasize <clears throat> the importance of unequal development inequality, horizontal inequality is actually as a source of conflict. And so I, I think that tying in some of these, these different thematic issues that are, have been now generated from the open working group processes uh, would be a way forward. And I think one of the problems with the uh, what has come out of the open working group process is that you've got this sort of list of themes that appear to be unrelated, in fact, they are related. Um, now, on the question of um, um, accountability, I mean, I, I think it's very difficult to talk about accountability in, in a single voice because, you know, I think in the realm of global governance, you have multiple situations, multiple actors, multiple legal. Uh, regimes. Uh, there are situations in which I think international human rights law can be more uh, proactively used and applied. And in fact, in many national uh, legal processes, there is uh, increasing use of international human rights laws and standards, particularly for, e for, for issues related to development, to e for, for, uh, related to economic and social rights. But uh, clearly, that's not the only way that we're talking about accountability. And I think in terms of, we, we should think in terms of strengthening processes, mechanisms of accountability. Um, and certainly issues like uh, the, the strengthening the voice of civil society at both national and international levels, in, in national and international fora, to address a national and international um, Policy questions would be another way of strengthening. 
so finally, I, I do want to say that, that you know, when we talk about accountability, particularly for development, we, we should always keep in mind that, that this should not just be accountability of states to the international community or to a group of peer, uh, peer states, but that there has to be accountability too. Thank you.